All right, we're going to get started here in about two minutes. I'm just waiting for the attendees to keep signing on here. Looks like there's people are starting to join. All right, if you're just signing on, we're hanging tight here. I'm just waiting for a few more people to jump on board. It looks like we're getting pretty close. <clears throat> we're at 11. I'm going to give it a little bit more time. All right, well, let's get started here. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lance Waffen-Smith. I'm a member of a 12-person business development group with Empowermation. For the past two years, my primary focus has actually revolved around the Festo product line, and I deal with both the uh, pneumatics and their electric drives areas. I've been with Empowermation for 14 years, uh, the majority of the time, as an automation specialist focused on motion control and power transmission. And the uh, Festo line was a uh, jumped, uh, jumped at us, so I wanted to be a part of it. And so opted into that in 2018 when we, start, when we added the line. Um, I'm basically here to assist both uh, customers, customer base and our sales reps to solve automation challenges and uh, find solutions to problems they're facing. Uh, so thank, I just wanted to thank everybody first for joining the presentation. Uh, for those unfamiliar with PowerMation, short intro, uh, we're a technology-focused solution provider out of the Midwest. And uh, if this is your first experience with us, I invite you to jump on PowerMation.com and check out our website. We're adding new content daily and have a big push now to make that uh, website very powerful for the customer base. Uh, our primary presenter this morning is Steve Bain. Steve's the industry segment uh, manager for food and beverage in Festo US. He's a chemical engineer by degree, and he's worked for Kimberly Clark and Ecolab in engineering roles before joining Festo in 2011. He works on a national level and is a primary interface between Festo employees and customers to work through food and beverage applications and is a master in both compliance and food regulations. He resides in Denver, has a wife and two kids and enjoys skiing and hiking when he can find the time. Now on to the show here. Uh, this morning we'll conclude a three-part FISMA webinar series by taking a deeper dive 
into the product selection of food and beverage applications and uh, discussing the products that, that are used in them. Feel free as the meeting progresses here in the right side of your screen, you'll see a chat area or chat uh, drop down. Feel free to submit questions as we go forward here. And I'll be monitoring that chat window to, uh, to answer those questions. Uh, without uh, further ado, I'll uh, ask Steve to take it away. All right, thanks a lot. So this is uh, part three of a three-part series. Uh, the previous two presentations were about equipment design considerations for FISMA compliance and then what additional benefits can come from those. Today we're going to do a deep dive on the actual products themselves and what options there are. Can, can we mute the other people? Um, so then um, the other two presentations are going to be available on the FESTA YouTube channel. So if you missed those, they're great presentations and I, I suggest you go check them out. Uh, real brief intro to FESTA. Uh, we're a $3 billion manufacturer of uh, pneumatic and electromechanical components and automation solutions. Uh, we're also the world's largest supplier of pneumatics for the food and beverage industry. So we see a lot of applications and, and are involved with a, a lot of customers in this space. You may know us for our catalog products, but we also uh, provide complete solutions. We do a lot of customized components, especially for the food industry. Uh, we conduct services like uh, energy assessments and leakage detection, and we're the world's largest industrial training company. So very brief summary of, of the, really the, the first presentation on what is FISMA. Uh, FISMA was signed in the 2011. It was a major overhaul of uh, our food regulations and laws in the U.S. Uh, as part of that, we did a deep dive into CFR 117.40, which is a summary of the G, uh, good manufacturing practices for equipment and utensils. You can see what these 13 laws are. Uh, we're not going to go through them today, but uh, that's kind of what drove the first presentation. And from that, we came across with five key ideas. Uh, machinery needs to be designed to be cleanable, not just actually clean. Food contact surfaces can't have cracks or crevices or introduce any contaminants. Machinery needs to be capable of withstanding cleaning processes, uh, not just capable of being clean, but also you know, some new aggressive cleaning processes are put into place and your equipment needs to be able to withstand that. Even machinery that does not contact food needs to be capable of being cleaned. And at a minimum, a 0, 0.01 micron filter at point of use should be used for compressed air contact with direct food. From that, we kind of looked at it, you know, right from a festival perspective, what does that mean? Um, means using components with reduced cracks and crevices, using components with FDA approved polymers and NSF H1 grease, and then where possible standardizing on N-thread and G-threads, which are parallel fittings because those reduce cracks and crevices. And then a summary of the second presentation, if you incorporate all these things, uh, you can see a lot of energy savings by being able to move your valves closer to your process because they have a higher IP rating with sand wash down, you can shorten tubing lengths. Uh, with shorter tubing lengths, you can also have potentially faster machine performance, more consistent machine performance, maybe even improving quality with that. Um, but then also cleanability is a big deal, allowing you to have less um, time when the machine is down when you have to clean it. If you can clean it faster, you can run it more often and improve your OE that way as well. A lot of these components uh, feature TPM friendly things like red green indication and tamper proofing. And then a lot of these components are also designed to help reduce maintenance. And so things like uh, self adjusting cushioning on air cylinders is a really big deal for uh, reducing downtime, reducing startup time for new equipment. And with that, Festo has a really good portfolio for the food industry to be able to. Uh, look at all these different applications. And this is the basket of products for the most part that we'll review today. And 
and dive like what, what features, what choices are important within these. So we're going to start with compressed air preparation. Um, some key features on these products are uh, visual indication. So this is a really big deal in the food and beverage end user market. Uh, red green indication allows someone who's maybe not trained on what something does, but they can certainly see if something has changed from green to red, they know something's wrong. So instead of starting up the line or trying to start the line, something's wrong and radioing the maintenance, the line doesn't run. Them radioing in, hey, my pressure gauge is red, not green. Or maybe they even recognize, oh, that means I forgot to, to turn this valve on, um, can save a lot of time. And that's really the benefit of red green indication is allowing un, untrained people to be able to recognize where there might be issues. Uh, other things, uh, lockout tag out. So safety feature, uh, especially for compressed air, being able to exhaust all the air and then ensures that, that no one can tamper with it by having a lock. And then also uh, a lockable regulator is a really big deal too, because there's um, a lot there's a lot of operators who like to go just twist knobs when they can, just to see if they can adjust the machine performance, make it do better. Um, but that really takes the the goal of um, you know an engineer's job of trying trying to line stuff out and make it perform consistently. It takes that ability away from them, so tamper proofing becomes a very big deal as well. And then the MS series is what we'll really be focused on today. It's a highly modular series, and there's a lot of different components that can go into it. We're not going to touch on most of them. It's, we're really going to be focused on the filtration levels, but there, there are a lot of other things that can go into this, like regulators and energy-saving modules, uh, safety valves. So in order to talk about air quality, we need to talk about what it is and how it's measured. So the... Air quality classes are defined by ISO 8573, and they're broken out into solids, water, and oil. And you would typically write an example air quality as 543, which means it's level five for solid particulates. In this case, meaning it has less than 100,000 particles per cubic meter. Four for water, which in this case would mean a dew point of less than three degrees Celsius, and then three for oil, which means less than one milligram per cubic meter of oil. And you know, if someone were to say, well, what's, what's the right air quality? Well, it really depends on the application. Um, and it also all starts with the compressor. So, you know, your compressor process is typically pre-filtration, then a compressor, and then drying the air, and then storage tanks accumulation, your network, um, all of that, we have a general recommendation of a minimum of air quality of 744 coming out of that process. In the food environment, uh, if you have a new plant and a um, and a oil-free compressor, that oil quality might be significantly less than four, um, which is good. But you still have to be able to treat your process knowing all the different variables to ensure that your food is safe. Um, there's also a lot of factories that maybe don't have the best dryer, or maybe it's a great dryer 90% of the year, and then certain days it's just too hot, too, too humid, that it's not able to completely dry out all that air. And, and th if that's the case, um, we do have a liquid water separator that, can, that removes 99.9% .9 of liquid water in the air. Um, so for critical applications or where you might not have adequate drying. This is a good, really good solution. There was a, I went to a factory once and the maintenance tech told me that twice a year their, their pneumatic lines become hydraulic. And that's always stuck with me. It's like, um, this would be a good solution to prevent that from happening. So the, in terms of filtration, our coarsest filter is our uh, 40 micron filter. And that's pretty typical. Um, all festo components or the majority of festo components are built to have 40 micron air as a standard, uh, has a low pressure drop. It's a great general 40 micron filter. As you'll notice though, the air quality going from class 744 to 744 doesn't really improve. Uh, and that is because 
40 micron filter is already um, expected out of the compressor, this is more of a catch-all. You're, you're going to get rust in your pipes. You're going to get particulate over time. You don't want that to pass in your process. And that's, that's why you would use a 40 micron filter. Um, let's say you wanted to go a 5 micron filter. So this next slide is just showing, all right, I've got an on off and then a 5 micron filter and then a safety valve. Um, now we're getting down to 644 quality air. And uh, where this would be used, it's generally for serving pneumatics. Um, so any proportional valves that Festo has um, would generally require 5 micron air. Uh, the motion terminal uses 5 micron air, um, but it actually has its own pre-filter anyway for the pilot side. So um, you don't necessarily have to filter it that low. But um, if I was designing a machine for a food factory, I, I would probably lean towards 5 micron. Um, you, you have longer life out of your equipment with it at the expense of a slightly higher pressure drop. So it's a give and take. Uh, next, uh, let's see. you wanted to add a one micron filter. What this does is removes oil content, um, some amount of, of it. If there's any liquid in there, this will get pulled out of there too. But it's really about removing oil and then particulates as well. And so this is a coalescing filter. And what's being shown here is our MS6 series actually connecting to an MS9 uh, one micron filter with a differential pressure indicator. So that will tell you when you need to change filter. But the benefit here then is that, you know, that MS9 for a coalescing filter generally has a, a lot lower flow rate than this respective five micron filter in the same series. And so instead of having the whole thing be MS9, you can start with MS6, go to the MS9 for the filtration that you need, um, reducing size, reducing cost. Um, but so that's a nice feature to be able to adapt between sizes. In the food industry, um, that I personally have never recommended just going to one micron for really any application. Uh, if you're going to do that, I would recommend going all the way to 0.01 um, because that is, is kind of where a lot of the guidelines and requirements are for compressed air quality for food contact. Um, and so this next slide showing five micron, then one micron, then 0.01 micron going from 744 down to 142. Now we're starting to get into what is generally acceptable for food contact air. Um, there's a lot of factories and organizations that specify you need a three-stage filtration with a 0.1 micron filter to meet, let's say, an SQF guideline. Um, so this, this compressed air preparation unit would fulfill that. But there's also the possibility of uh, vapors having um, odor. And so for a lot of food, uh, if you're going to blow compressed air and that air might have an odor, uh, that's not a good thing. So adding an activated carbon filter will remove that risk from happening. And so oftentimes we will recommend 141 quality air for, for food applications. But what if that is too moist? What if, what if there's too much water even in that? Uh, that's where adding a membrane dryer might come into play. So getting down to one three one air, a uh, common application might be, let's say, uh, blowing open a, a bag prior to filling it with a dry product like bread or chips. You know, you don't want that dry product to absorb any moisture from the air that's in that bag. And so keeping the keeping the uh, that air a little drier helps prevent that. And if you need really dry air, uh, getting down to one two one with the addition of an absorption dryer. Um, this is where super sensitive foods to moisture would come into play. And also uh, applications where, you know, maybe it's a, air, a compressed air blanket over a product, or maybe you're pneumatically conveying product where that air is in contact with the food for an extended period of time, uh, this might become a better option as well. So what about lubricators? I've been to a lot of food factories. I see a lot of lubricators in food factories. It's, it's really an older technology. Um, basically, all, all modern pneumatics are designed for unlubricated air. Uh, there's a handful of exceptions. Um, air motors are one, and then pneumatic vibrators are another. 
Um, but all festival components are lubricated for life. They're designed for unlubricated air. Um, so the downside is once you introduce a lubricator to a system, you have to lubricate that system for life. You have to keep maintaining that uh, food factory. You're, you're introducing potential contaminants. Um, and all, all that air gets exhausted somewhere, right? And, and so it's, it's not a good practice if you can avoid it. And if you're going to remove a lubricator from an existing system, you need to replace the entire downstream pneumatic system from that. You have to replace the fittings, the tubings, the valves, because all that residual oil in there will make will work its way back and wash out the factory lubrication. So um, we have a bunch of uh, pre-configured air prep units that are uh, sitting on the shelf in Ohio, ready to meet these various air quality classes at various flow rates. And so we try to make it easy uh, for for the food industry to meet their goals in terms of air quality and food safety. So next we'll jump into fittings and tubing. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we highly recommend sticking with parallel threads when you can. Parallel threads are M threads or G threads. Um, the reason for that is a tapered thread by design when you screw it in still has exposed threads and it requires sealant. Um, so that sealant could fall into your product it could fall into the pneumatic system, um, and it's a very difficult thing to clean. So, so going with parallel threads where you can is important. Um, so here is a list of our fittings that we have FDA approval on, but um, even some of these are our threads. So our CRQS is our thread, our NPQP is our thread. So I, these are not ones that I would normally recommend for the food industry. Um, my recommendations normally are NPQH by default, and then moving to NPCK if it needs to be very hygienic. And then we have a new NPQR fitting, which is a 316L stainless steel fitting um, that's also a G-thread. So in, in more aggressive applications that aren't directly over the food zone, this might be a good choice. And then for tubing, uh, we have four tubing series that we generally recommend for the food industry, our PUNH is the go-to for sure. That's great for packaging equipment, very flexible, uh, awesome tubing all around. Uh, then all the way on the other side, our PFAN is extremely chemical resistant, very high pressure, very high temperature, and also EC 1935-2004 certified, which is uh, a newish, uh, food safety requirement from Europe for plastics. And so if you need that certification, we have it in this series. Um, kind of below the PFN in terms of performance, but still pretty close, is a PTFEN, which is tough on tubing. And this is probably what I would go for unless you need that 1935 certification, or if you're kind of at that extreme on the temperature and pressure curve on where PTFEN is, PFAN is slightly better. So with that kind of recommended fittings and tubing, I would standardize on NPQH fittings and PUNH tubing where we can, um, and then using the VFOH flow control as kind of the equivalent to the NPQH fitting for hygienic applications, concentrated chemicals, going to the NPCK fitting, or, or maybe the NPQR along with PTFEN is a great fit as well. And then for outdoor applications, high pressure, high temp, going with NPQH and PTFEN. So, you know, going into cylinders, you know, we have all these different cylinders, and one of the features that we keep talking about is a self adjust cushioning. So we have um, uh, the self-adjusting cushion, just like the G-threads, helps eliminate cracks and crevices from popping up. And so we have, um, with this, you can, our cylinders have either uh, just the bumpers or we have two versions of air cushion. We have adjustable, which is our PPV, or self-adjusting, which is PPS. And I always recommend PPS for, for most applications, about 90% of applications is the ideal, um, it's the ideal solution. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, you don't have to cycle the cylinder a bunch of times when you install it to set the cushioning. Uh, the cylinder adapts over time as wear characteristics change. Um, 
you don't have an adjustment point period, so it's tamper proofing. If you look at this picture, these are showing PPV actuators. I mean, some of those are going to be hard to adjust, and if it was PPS, you wouldn't even need to be concerned about that. Another feature on our cylinders is the different seal types. We have a lot of different seal types available. Uh, these two are the only ones that are FDA approved, but we do have all these other options and, and they're appropriate for different applications where you need different seals to have the application last longer. And we have our clean design family of actuators. Our CRD SNU is our stainless steel version, and then the other three all are heavy anodized aluminum, and we'll dive into these. So the CRD SNU is a uh, 304 body, 316 rod, and um, has PBS cushioning, has a lot of variants, has NSF H1 grease. In my opinion, this is the best pneumatic actuator in the industry. Um, just an absolute workhorse. Um, great bearing strength. There's no downside to this cylinder. Uh, as I said, it's um, very high quality materials, um, easy to clean. And then NSF H1 grease, the different seal options uh, has the laser plating is even laser, the, the label is laser engraved um, to make sure that that can't rinse off in your process either. Uh, for a standard design, we have, it's a polyurethane seal. It's our media seal, so this is the FDA approved one. For uh, high temp, you can move the S6 option. For acid resistance, you can move to the A1 option. Both of those actually come with the same seal. The difference is the S6 also has a different grease um, for higher temp. But, the, this seal is a Viton seal and it has very good resistance to acids. The A3 option, as I mentioned, is FDA approved. Uh, this is a great seal for unlubricated applications and uh, things where that might come into play is where maybe your process is very wet and the cylinder rod is continually getting wet during the process and the grease washes off over time or maybe uh, you have the rod extended during the cleaning process and the grease literally gets washed off. Um, those cases, this is a self-lubricating UHMW seal and we've seen uh, service life up to a million cycles in those applications and, and that's uh, really good for, for how aggressive those applications are. We have our TT option, which is our low temperature. Um, and this is a, also has a really good scraper for particulates like ice or sugar crystals. And then if it's not cold, but you still need the hard scraper, we have the A2 option. Next actuator we're gonna look at is the DGRF. And so this has, uh, this is a guided cylinder. Um, really great guiding system and a lot of different options as well. Um, you can come with PPS or PPV. It has a sensor rail that you can install sensor on. And then it has uh, two different sealing options. So you can get the standard seal, which is the media seal, um, or you can get the A3, which is for the unlubricated operation. Our DSPF cylinder is another member of the family. This is an ISO 1552 uh, cylinder. And so this is a drop into our DSPC cylinder, if you're familiar with that. Um, but again, having the PPS cushioning available, standard with NSF H1 grease, FDA seals, a uh, whole host of options. I think this cylinder might have the most options of any cylinder we have. A DSPC might, might be too, but um, it's re really very customizable for, for your given needs. And with that, we developed a special uh, sensor that can go on this rail. This also goes on the DGRF. And so this is an IP67 sensor. And uh, so this is designed for um, easier cleanability. It's, there's no such thing as a perfectly hygienic sensor, but we tried to come close with this. Next, we'll dive into valve manifolds. Um, this is probably um, my favorite product that Festo offers, the MPAC. It's so versatile, so well-designed. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time 
developing it. And so the goal was like, we just, we wanted a great platform for the global food and bio market on what, what a bowel manifold should be. And with that, we wanted it to be reliable, wanted it to be very hygienic, wanted to meet the performance standards that were required. And we really wanted to be innovative. And I think we, we hit it out of the park with this. And so it's an IP69K valve manifold. It's our highest corrosion resistance. So our internal testing, um, very corrosion resistant. Uh, you can configure it by single grids, meaning you could have a one station valve manifold or a 20 station valve manifold, it's up to you. And its shape allows it to uh, make sure that no matter how you orient it, there's no way for puddles to accumulate on it. And so it's, it's going to drip off your, your cleaning chemicals and then your water and then nothing will be left. And it's very smooth. Um, all the elastomers are APDM, all the external materials are FDA approved. Even the sealing system was designed in such a way that when you assemble it, it puts a strain on the seal. And then if you hit it with high pressure, that high pressure only enhances how well it's sealing. And in doing so, you don't get any leaks. And even if you did, there's a second layer inside protecting the pneumatic channels and the electronics. And so um, it, it's almost impossible to think of a way that your high pressure washdown process is going to defeat this valve um, in in any period of time. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't had a field failure, uh, which is quite impressive. As I mentioned, there's a single sub base design. There's a lot of different options for it. For the electronics, you can configure it with single solenoid or double solenoid uh, grids, which means, you know, if you use all single solenoid, then you can have uh, a much bigger valve manifold. Uh, for the externals, we actually have the option of a manual override without even having to open up the cover. And so you can test your, your valves to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be. Uh, if you don't want that for tamper-proof reasons, you can also order it without the manual override. And you can configure a lot of different fitting options. Um, so NPQH is the standard, but you can actually order this with NPCK, the hygienic fitting. You can order it with the cable pointing up or the cable pointing down. Uh, and then we also focused a lot on the pneumatic performance. Um, looking at some of the other options on the market, um, that there's a lot of restrictions on how much air they can actually handle. And so our working ports are G1 quarter, but our exhaust ports are G3 eighths. And that's to ensure that our the valve manifold itself isn't limiting how much air can flow through it. And then there's a lot of pressure zone capabilities. It's probably the most flexible valve manifold on the market um, in terms of pressure zoning. And, uh, you can order every valve slice with five ports and all five ports can be completely independent of the valve next to it. And so it really does give you a ton of capabilities. Uh, it's, uh, for communications, it all comes in one cable. And we can even connect that to the CTEU system. So you can network this with IO link. You can uh, connect this to any field bus, really. And it's part of the whole Festo family communications um, that you're used to. Next, we'll dive into the VCQA process valve. Uh, so this is a, it's a pinch element. So it's, it's a tube. And then when you apply air, it closes. And in doing so, there's no cracks and crevices. There's no, um, it's, it's great for handling even like grainy material or, you know, I don't know if, you, if you're like trying to medically convey corn, like this would be a great valve for that because you could just close and if corn gets stuck in it, it's fine. It's not gonna, um, but it, the point is that nothing, nothing's really gonna get trapped and it's not gonna damage the valve. So, really cool and then we also came out with a normally closed version so if you were to apply air it opens and it does that with a spring mechanism but that, that's a great product as well um, so there's a lot of different options 
both normally open, both normally closed, a lot of different end connections. I uh, gen generally recommend the, the tri plant for the food industry, but for applications that need threads, no problem. We have V-threading and NPT. Uh, we also have uh, polymer ends, polymer bodies, aluminum bodies, and so there's really a lot of choices for this valve. Um, again, there's um, three different sizes. We have normally open, normally closed. We have three different membrane materials. We have the NBR, then we have the EPDM, which is FDA approved, and then the silicon, which is FDA approved. The silicon is also 1935 slash 2004 certified. So with that, we have uh, the complete portfolio for the food industry. Um, if, if you're looking at pneumatics for a food application, Festo is really the way to go on this. It, uh, between having the compressed air preparation, all the clean design actuators, the wash down valve manifold, the right fittings and tubings even, um, you know, it's, it's a great portfolio. Um, and it can be hard and daunting sometimes when you're looking at a new process on, on what to look at. And so uh, we have put together a recommended product guide for the food industry. So, you know, it's narrowing down our 30,000 products to just the newest and most current components typically used in the food industry and highlighting different applications where they can be used. This is a great document and I, I suggest you reference it. So again, some final recommendations. Request actuators with NSF H1 grease, especially in the food zone. Request products with FDA approved materials. Standardize on M threads and G threads. Request products with reduced cracks and crevices. Request Festo. Before we get to questions, um, starting tomorrow is our Festo experience. It's a online virtual trade show. And I think we'll put a link up here, um, but highly recommend you you register, you, you come check out some of the booths. It's not just gonna be about food. There's a lot of other applications. You can learn about Industry 4.0 um, or explosive environments. Like There's just a lot of different booths and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be there. So with that, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Steve. Yes, I'm glad you touched on the uh, virtual trade show. I uh, also just want to go over quick the YouTube channel for Festo US as the previous two uh, webinars of the series. So for for those of you unaware, the there were three. This is a three part series. This is the third of three. And the first two are on the Festo US YouTube channel, and I invite you all to check that out. I don't, I'm not seeing anything come through on questions. Maybe I'll just throw one out that as uh, as I'm thinking about it. Steve, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. So, um, you know, the G thread. Are you seeing? Are you seeing uh, more people gravitate to the the use of G-thread versus NPT? Is that something that's getting more popular in the U.S. market? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, when we first started having conversations with customers on this, you know, it was, it was generally, oh, you know, well, we use all NPT, so that's that's what it's got to be. Um, but the I think the focus isn't inch versus metric. It's not. Um, NPT versus parallel even, the, the focus is food safe versus not food safe. And if you can convince yourself that it's better to make a simple choice and to be more hygienic when you can for the same cost, why wouldn't you do that? Then you logically can, can open yourself up to say, all right, you know, we should probably just go ahead and make the switch. All future builds are going to be G-thread. It's another big benefit to that too is that um, you know, if, you, if you're a machine builder and you're shipping equipment to Europe, it's going to come with the fittings and tubing that they're used to. And uh, the U.S. has a lot of equipment coming from Europe that all has G-threads anyway. And so most food factories have ample amounts of metric fittings and tubing already. I think it's just the, 
kind of the stigma around, um, you know, what you're used to being a tapered thread doesn't always mean it's appropriate. Thank you. All right, one question came through here. Is the FISMA focus drive driven from end user or OEM typically? Um, it's a good question. So in the US market, in the, in the European market, the equipment manufacturer is ultimately responsible for food safety issues. Um, this is why they write very thorough manuals uh, so that if an end user were to follow all the manual to the letter and that food somehow turned out to be a hazard, that falls back on the OEM because their machine wasn't designed properly then. In the US, it really falls back on the end user. And so um, the end user is the one dealing with the FDA inspections. The end user is the one dealing with the required documentation. So ultimately, the end user is the one who cares a lot about FISMA. And it's really the end user who should be pushing all these changes back into the OEM and demanding these changes of better cleanability, um, monitoring the processes, uh, you know, better documentation or automation of documentation around um, temperatures or, or vision inspection and things like that. Uh, it's really coming from the end user side. And uh, on the machine builder side, where we're seeing a lot of the development is on um or some of them that are being either working with end users that are very aggressive about this or just having a little bit more uh, forward thinking in the market and trying to to get ahead of the curve and because i think machine builders who are out of the curve here are going to be more successful in the short and long term thank you all right another one that just came in here for me uh for powermation uh, being asked about advantages of working with us, with PowerMation as a solution provider for food and beverage offering. Um, you know, as I think of our history with PowerMation, I think that's our strength. So I would answer it by saying we've been, you know, we have since 1961, we've been supporting the Midwest for these markets and there's a, there's a large install base of food and beverage customers in these markets. So we've learned uh, a lot about the needs of the customer base um, without mentioning any names. There's just some, there's, there's huge companies in this area that have a, you know, a, a big presence in the world uh, with some very popular food names. And we, we, we've just got a long history of, supporting those customers, understanding their needs, and then knowing what products that they're gonna need to fit into those 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 areas. Um, you know, without getting into many other vendors, we've, we, we have a host of vendors, what, Banner to, to name one, Turk, uh, several others that have food and beverage solutions as well. So we can bring the whole entire solution to the marketplace with Festo, uh, coming along as well so it's full product offering and um, long history in the area so look to us for that and uh, i'll also mention quick our custom group so we've got powermation solutions group as an llc that was established where we are able to take and create custom solutions using our manufacturer's components and putting them in you know some examples would be a stainless electrical en enclosure consisting of uh you know full NEMA 4 with a NEMA 4x rating that has you know a full breadth of products within it to solve a problem um, we can give you a ul listed panel that's uh you know ready to go for these environments um let's see it's just reading one more here all right festo the question is 
is Festo and PowerMation open to doing machine audits and plant walkthroughs to look for areas that are in need of improvement? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll comment on PowerMation. We, I would say, you know, you know, currently here sitting on August fourth, with the you know in, in the middle of the COVID thing, it's changed a little bit on whether or not we can get out into into sites or into businesses. It seems like some of these large food plants are less open to us, but you know certainly when things are opening up, yes, we're able to go out and and walk through, look at uh, look at the equipment. We prefer it. I'd say that's our primary focus is to get out and actually put our hands on stuff. We're very hands-on as an organization and we'd like to see stuff firsthand because uh, you know it's not always easy to describe this stuff you know, on the phone. But we've been doing a lot of webinars and a lot of uh, teams meetings to talk through challenges customers are having right now. So, and uh, you know, maybe I'll ask, uh, go back to Festo as well. Uh, do you, what do you guys see in that area as far as walkthroughs or what services do you provide, Steve? Um, for us to see the equipment, that it's amazing how many things people don't even pay attention to because they've been using the same piece of equipment that way for years. Um, so they don't recognize that there are maybe other ways to do things. Um, so just having a new set of eyes that comes in from a different perspective, like, like Festo does, uh, can help quite a bit in identifying ways to improve food safety, but also improve uptime or help with changeovers, you know, to just being able to identify where there are problems and how we can fix them. Um, but yes, this is something we do quite a bit of. Yep. Well, I think that uh, as I'm looking at the chat, yeah, that covered everything. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Well, I guess that, that looks to be uh, the end of it here. So I guess I'm going to say I appreciate everybody for reviewing the, the webinar here. And if you've been a part of all three series, we really appreciate you spending the time with us. And thank you, Steve, for for sharing your uh, sharing the things you've learned as well. So Thanks if, uh, without further, I'm going to close out and have a good one.